Well, once again, I'd like to thank everyone involved with this conference for this invitation. It comes for, from something of a surprise. I've been directing my energies a lot for the last eight or ten years on ocean environmental issues. Uh, I do a lot of work with indigenous groups these days in marine spatial planning, but a lot of applied cross-fertilization between ocean and policy. But my, my love is in my training as a historian, and the, the core element uh, in in my work, whether it's the contemporary work or the historical work, involves understanding the role of water in, in how our society functions. And like so much of the work that we do, why I do this is related to my own personal biography. I am from a family that for generations in Norway and then later in Alaska were, were fishermen and merchant mariners, and that's how I began my life at the age of nine. Um, when I was 16, uh, I lived in a small rural town in Alaska, and I was fishing crab instead of going to school, which was a common occurrence for me, uh, which was reflected in my grades. Uh, my appendix exploded, and the medical care was very bad locally, and they didn't catch it. And I ended up in a public hospital in Anchorage, Alaska, operated by the federal government. And it was the Alaska Native Service Hospital, but it also, in those days, took care of mariners, which was a legally specified group. Um, that I didn't really know I was one of those, uh, but it had a very clear legal definition, and in various ways, since almost the beginning of the country, mariners were, their health care was, was a national issue of priority. So I spent 30, 30 terrifying days in, in a pretty rough place, but one thing my parents didn't have to worry about was how to pay for this. My, my health care was, was decent, and it gave me, I think, a, a sense or, or, or an interest in these things called hospitals, an interest I didn't get back to probably 20 years, but it's, but it's there. Um, I spent uh, a good chunk of my life uh, in the Midwest where I was, uh, did my undergraduate education, and then uh, after a first round of graduate school, I went back and worked for the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. And Wisconsin is uh, certainly a, a, an important place in the historiography, American historiography, um, and my job ended up being interpreting Great Lakes, rivers, uh, getting involved in historic preservation of properties. And ultimately that turned into rediscovering connections between the water and, and, the, and the society around us that had largely been forgotten. Uh, that, that, that the Midwest, which has become, you know, was the great industrial heartland where we built cars, and Wisconsin, the place where we have cheese, and where the Green Bay Packers comes from, that's the dominant idea uh, instead of processes that, that really covered people's sense of identity. But what I looked at, what I started to discover was in the 19th century, the Midwest had frontier processes that were strikingly similar to what I had observed in the North Pacific context, where the frontier stories were still unfolding, and that I found, in retrospect, that I'd been a part of. And so that informs um, a lot of that. This picture may be familiar with, for, to some in this room, uh, in the United States, it, it's probably more familiar, uh, although few of my students can put a name to it. Uh, this is an 1870-ish uh, painting called American Progress, and it looks at, or it, it depicts, of course, the moving of American society from one coast to the other, manifest destiny, uh, which is, again, a big part of our, our, our national narrative. And we can see, all kind of, it was a little better resolution, Buffalo and indigenous people being pushed aside in front of all of this progress. And there's trains, and a little bit in the back there, you can see a little bit of water. But it presents a, a romanticized view of, of, of America and of, of frontier progress that's essentially terrestrially based. And our stories of the West are much more about the open prairie and, and wagon trains, which in fact isn't true. It isn't true. But, uh, um, if we start looking at the processes I'm going to unveil, the, 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 the first real frontier of the United States was a maritime frontier. Um, but to the, to the topic that I'm going to get to today, and this is going to be a very broad talk, and I'm going to try to move quickly, but I find as I approach 50 and I get back on the conference circus, I'm much longer-winded than I used to be. You know, I used to be enthusiastic, now I'm long-winded. Um, maritime issues are really uh, significant in a whole variety of ways. If we're looking at, at some of the factors that being a maritime, being involved in maritime activities uh, are associated with, and that means professionally or moving as a, as a passenger or an immigrant or whatever we want to call it, transient people 
are, uh, they transmit diseases, and I will apologize up front, I'm also dyslexic, and I was a little tired when I was messing with this, which I shouldn't do. Um, exposure to injury, um, it, the ocean is a, and rivers are a dangerous place. Medical treatment is often very difficult for a variety of reasons, and we'll see at the end, this is, this is absolutely true today. Um, it also, these processes put tremendous financial and social burdens on port cities, and of course the cities, for all intents and purposes, all the great cities, were port cities. In the United States and in many other places, uh, public health structures evolved in maritime contexts, dealing with, with epidemics and uh, later with immigration. In the story of Mariners, where again we have this legally specialized group that for a long time in, in, uh, in Western history and possibly elsewhere have really been legally distinguished as different from the people on land. If we look at uh, ideas, uh, legal uh, uh, clauses such as cure and maintenance, uh, uh, back in you know a thousand years ago, we were dealing with with the question: How do we take care of people who are important to us but aren't part of our community, and in that sense represent a threat? So there's a long history to all of these things. So I guess I'm I'm fundamentally a historian and probably a, a maritime historian. Much of my graduate work involved history of medicine and public health and one of the questions I sometimes need to answer is what, what is it about maritime things that make it important to look at? Well, I think when we, when we look at the history of medicine, one of the things that the maritime approach does is it emphasizes movement with a focus on how life works, how it moves, and not how science and professions triumph. That's an important uh, corrective to uh, certainly some kinds of institutional history. And I think it looks at pervasive and enduring factors that integrate things like geography, culture, and economics in very seamless sorts of ways. It was until fairly recently a pretty forgotten property, uh, but now, of course, people have discovered it and everybody starts to understand that water is important. Um, uh, some considerations to think about maritime-related transiency. Uh, it fails in a historiographical sense to fit into our stories of American hospitals. And uh, there was excellent scholarship in the uh, 70s, 80s, into the early 90s on the American hospital and work by Charles Rosenberg, Skid Care of Ch Strangers, for example, really remains the dominant uh, or the most consistently referenced history and interpretation of American hospitals. And Rosenberg, in this masterful synthesis, chooses to look at doctors as physicians, elite physicians, as the dominant influence on what becomes the American hospital. It's, it's, it's patriarchal it's, it, and it's medical in its orientation and it's fine as far as it goes but it blocks out a lot of other things. And rooted in the experience of, of the northeastern United States, particularly in uh, elite places such as Massachusetts, New York, Philadelphia, it, it uh, implies a national set of patterns on something that's actually far more regional. And if we look beyond that, those borders into this frontier, that was developing at the same time uh, in terms of medical institutions, we find strikingly uh, different patterns that emerge. And these patterns are related to the water, they're related to westward expansion, they're related to the nature of government and how we interpret it. Uh, all of these things were not really fit well into, did not fit well into uh, most of the historiography. A little bit of how I root my work, uh, not to a, a hugely theoretical extent, but as an implied extent, I, I look at, at the, the American frontier uh, as part of uh, the Atlantic world. And if we look at it in the age of sail and things, the Atlantic world's got some, some, some physical properties that uh, condition how it, how it functions, how it connects to culture and places. And, and in the age of sail, a natural kind of circularity to it. And as we see in the Midwest, as they move in, uh, pretty rapidly, uh, that circularity is, is preserved. And in a very short period of time, uh, by the early part of the 19th century, as a European, you could move across and either go down, uh, crossing the Erie Canal and down, or sail through New Orleans and go up after steamboats are developed. And you could do this whole process, except for a couple hundred miles, by boat. And so it's a very permeable maritime setup. And I'm going to rush through some of this. Um, and I, um, but it, but it needs to be rooted in these processes of, of maritime expansion. And I shouldn't need to say this, but if we look at, at the American historiography and the regional historiography, 
again, there, there are real edges and, and borders, and the ocean was not really integrated into that. But in fact, it's all about uh, westward expansion. Uh, for a long time, they were trying to get to China, and they discovered that there were all sorts of other things they could get in the meantime. Um, so I look at it as a maritime frontier. What's that mean? Well, initial settlement patterns, Euro-American uh, Euro settlement patterns, but really if we look at indigenous patterns, are maritime and water-based. Water facilitates rapid growth. It encourages a chaotic, at least initially, social environment that we associate with urbanization in port cities. Western trade, and the place was about trade, was largely maritime-based. And frontier cities and involves some of the most more important cities in, in the United States were, were physically shaped by water, a footprint that, however disguised, is still readily evident once you go to them and you have this perspective. The lakes and the rivers really uh, influenced their, their, their physical layout and, to a great extent, in the early days, the construction of their politics and, and, and governance. Um, this just gives you a sense a little bit. It's very squiggly in the background. This is a map of the central part of the United States that lacks land, except some beach along the Gulf of Mexico, and then a representation of the Canadian borders. About 7,000 miles of navigable water, up to 50,000 miles, depending on, on, your, on your estimates, of floatable water, meaning you could use it at certain times of the year, very important uh, uh, to farmers and other, uh, others. And so this, this sort of co natural context it's one of the elements that facilitates rapid movement into this region once you've got uh, major geopolitical issues straightened out. Uh, imperial wars, um, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the indigenous warfare, a number of things that blocked it for 200 years. But once it opens up, it moves very rapidly. Um, who is coming into the West in the 19th century? Well, it's a mixture. Uh, the, ch the sort of charter group, for the most part, in some places you've got the French in St. Louis, and, and so there's always dangers at generalization. But then we get Old Yankee, uh, Mid-Atlantic, uh, Southern American stock, sort of the, 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 the core uh, 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 of the American nation, moves forward in differential patterns into this, into this region. By about 1815, 1817, we get uh, construction of canals, principally the Erie Canal, uh, linking up the Great Lakes and Buffalo, great engineering feat. Uh, a lot of Irish laborers involved in that, and then of course the Irish really come in the 1840s uh, with the famine, and it goes on. Uh, 1840s, we also see great increase in the, in the amount of uh, German immigration into the Midwestern region. And although the numbers aren't as big, uh, in terms of influence on, on maritime factors, the Scandinavian presence uh, becomes very significant uh, in, in the 1840s. Uh, so collectively, this makes the region by the middle part of the 19th century, one of the most dynamic, but it's also one of the most cosmopolitan or foreign of the American places, which is interesting when we look at the Midwest now, if we think about it, and a lot of people just sort of fly, out, fly over it, it is also held as the most American of places, and that's where they test market things, and Wonder Bread came from, and all sorts of things, color American. But, it, but at its origins, it was very dynamic, highly foreign. One element that, that comes out of the literature of the Midwest that I think is relevant to this conference is an observation by Kenneth Winkle and, and others that, that this, this level of transiency that this broader region experienced uh, was so pervasive, so universal, that, the, that, that this experience of transiency and dealing with transiency in many of the places um, subvent or overpower direct ethnic uh, uh, forces in shaping people's experience. I don't think that's always true, but I think it's often true, uh, and an and important element. So transiency is really critical. Um, starting about 1810, 1815, you get tremendous movement into the West. Uh, 1810 to 1820, a million people, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Most of them coming by, by water or walking along water paths. These are some of the early types of vessels that were used, uh, keel boats and flat boats and things like that. Now, in the Atlantic context, maritime laborers and maritime uh, ports are, are often associated with all kinds of uh, chaos that I'll illustrate more. And this is very true with how the West is characterized and experienced in this early period. So early boatmen, this is from uh, looking back from 1848 to the 1820s, proverbially lawless, dissolute, were often more numerous than the citizen and adopted without, without restriction every species of debauchery. Uh, so there's that image. And what we're going to see is 
is a number of images of people associated with the water that don't, don't fully resonate with one another, but lots of them are quite negative. 1832, such a stream of immigrants is continually pouring in, and the people have learned the habit of distrust, that, uh, so learned the habit of distrust that hospitality is not characteristic of these people. In other words, this is a bad place to get into trouble because people are tired of you and, and they're going to be on the, on the outlook for it and they're not going to be very nice, which was apparently the case oftentimes. Um, 1835, the life and manners of the West. A frontier is often the retreat of loose individuals who, whom, if not familiar with crime, have a very blunt perception of virtue. These are the poorest, idlest of the human race. And these are people who are promoting the West that are saying these things. And so they're taking a region that they really like, but they say, you've got to watch out for this stuff. You know, there's too many transients, but the boatmen, you know, be very careful. But by the 1830s, and I'm getting ahead of my story a little bit, um, there is the development of a very coordinated regional outcry for external aid to deal with the problem of, of indigent medical care, of transient medical care, and some... Uh, really unrecognized but important studies. And if you look at the, the studies that were taking place at the time and the reports, you get a very different image of who the, who the people of the water are when you're trying to ask for, for government aid. And, and, of course, it's the farmers and farmers' sons of the whole valley of the Mississippi engaged in transporting the laudable and valued business of transporting their own produce to market. They're the ones that are going down the river. They're the ones that are getting sick. And so, of course, you know, the, this is, this is, this, these are people that really require being helped, and because they're crossing borders, it certainly isn't for the province of individual communities, or, or even after a point, states to take care of them. If we look at, at images from the time, this is pretty washed out. This is George uh, Bingham's 1848, The Jolly Raftsman, and what this illustrates, one is elements of the chaos, and also is, is pretty good evidence to the ways this fits into an Atlantic world framework from from the multiple races to, to businessmen and the whole, the whole chaos uh, element that, that, that's, that, 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 it, that, it, that it implies. Um, it fits into a region, again, that grew very, very rapidly. Uh, Cincinnati, which is a major uh, river port in Ohio, the biggest city for a, for a good long time in that region, uh, pretty healthy, 2,500 people. Uh, in 1810, 115,000 by 1850. And to put this into context, by 1850, it's approaching Boston in population, approaching Boston in commercial activity, and that's in two generations. And we can look at, at images of the, of the period, and we see, see that in so many different ways. And I, I tend to hearken this back to, I uh, see some images, uh, this is Rowlandson looking at, at Portsmouth, but again, the level of chaos, uh, cosmopolitanism, disorder associated with port cities is associated in the same thing in this frontier context, and the responses are calibrated somewhat accordingly. There may be a significant disconnect between culture and reality uh, on these things, how far to apply stereotypes, but there is no question looking at, at the history and the evidence that the disease burden in frontier America was extremely high, higher than it was on the East Coast except in times of, of epidemics. Frontier conditions led to a tremendous rise in uh, malaria, for example, from the breaking up of uh, alterations of the ecosystem. And people don't realize it today, but the malaria belt in America used to run up into Minnesota uh, because of that process. And so traveling, uh, if you were a traveler and you were moving through these different disease zones, that certainly exacerbated your chances of getting ill, and that was certainly illustrated in maritime populations. But it was even worse for those farmers and sons of farmers who didn't travel that much and weren't as, as seasoned. So the disease burden is very high. And we add things like cholera and uh, typhus and uh, yellow fever that uh, visited. It was even more so. So lots of, lots of issues on that. Um, one of the key responses in the West, and it comes in, in stages, uh, beginning in the early 19th century, was to turn to hospitals to try to ameliorate what's considered a serious fiscal problem. These people are showing up and they're passing through your, our community and they're getting sick. These are communities that are newly established. Uh, traditional systems of poor law, even when you try to create them, do not work. They do not, and people resent having to pay for people from other, other places. So hospitals are established as what I call a bulwark against the human tide. A hospital in these early conditions are, is really a financial arrangement in some respects 
in places like Cincinnati and St. Louis, they, they successfully financed them by linking taxes on, on river commerce and business to, to hospital care. So they balance out the problems with, with the profits. Most places don't do that. And they don't do this, uh, and they're more reluctant to do that from the 1820s on when there's talk, really serious talk, of the development of comprehensive federal hospitals in that region. And so it's just enough of a difference that, that we don't, we, we, for a long period, except for one exception, we see no hospitals established in the West. And a lot of it, again, I think is, is related to the breakdown of will uh, created by the possibility of external uh, funding. Um, so again, Midwestern hospitals are first conceived as structural responses to uh, the problem of high levels of transiency. And there's a dissonance in all of this that frontier leaders, for the most part, ex except outside of some of the folks in, in, in Cincinnati and Louisville, tended to look at, at the commerce and success of their towns, and it's highly competitive, as somehow a reflective of their personal cardinal virtues, or the virtues of their people, the most enterprising, uh, you know, the most deserving. But the flip side of that equation, the transiency that comes with it, that brings that prosperity, now that's a national problem. They aren't our folks. It's unfair for us to have to take care of people from every place else. And so there's a serious dissonance in there that uh, many in Congress actually picked up. So we have a couple of different series of things. We've got these early hospitals that are linked to education, um, uh, municipal funding, uh, a little bit more on an East Coast model. Uh, but then nothing for a long time. And for almost a 30-year period, you have this, this federal period where, where there's efforts to build hospitals. Now, into this mix, well, the, the structure for this, of course, involves the U.S. Public Health Service, that, what is now the U.S. Public Health Service, that kind of hospital that I was in. Uh, but in those days, it was the Marine Hospital Fund. And the Marine Hospital Fund was created in 1798. It's the Organic Act for All American Activities in, in, in Public Health and, and any responses, medicine outside of the military. Um, and it was designed to be a self-funded self scheme. It's been looked at, I don't think, fully appropriately as the earliest form of social insurance. Uh, but it built on, again, these centuries of, of looking at sailors as a particular class, uh, on public policies that are related to the early modern period and things in, in England and other places, uh, ideas of... of uh, the Chatham chest. Uh, so there are these vague precedents that are out there in the ether in the 19th century. There's a sense that these hospitals exist on the East Coast, and the fact is it's a very proto and not terribly effective uh, setup in the East Coast. Uh, but with the pressure and growing wealth and political power of the West, this comes to, to the forefront, and, there, and this constant asking and power leads to ultimately leads to government action and the extension of this system into the West. Uh, the few people that have looked at the marine hospitals tend to look at it exclusively from the idea of, of hospitals that were operated uh, by the, the government. And, and the history on that is pretty checkered. But most medical care, most places, and certainly the greatest lasting influence was by the contracts that were let out to, by proxy, provide this care. This is, this is the uh, angle where most of the um, funding comes in. Now, one of the key parts that gets us into these ideas of, of who gets good health care and why and, and, and differences in quality of care that I allude to in my abstract involves that in the marine hospital system, again, it is, it is a, a system that, that sailors themselves are paying for. There's a deduction from their wages. The very forms that send them in is, is, it, you know, is entitled to the privileges of the marine hospital. It's not charity. It's certainly not charity in the mindset of the sailors that are paying for it, or, even though there's actually quite a bit of a government treasury as well. But they don't see it as treasury. It's not designed as treasury. And that's really significant as we get farther into the story. Um, I was going to talk more about Buffalo than I am, but it provides a Great Lakes context for all of this. Attention really shifts uh, in the mid-century from, well, there's a lot going on in the rivers, but the Great Lakes become heavily involved. And all of these waterways are integrated through canals. It's an extraordinary set of accomplishments. They, they literally create an ocean out of the Great Lakes by linking them up and linking them to the Atlantic. It's amazing stuff, and the results are, of course, tremendous growth and prosperity, and this is Buffalo, but one of the key points we can't get back of is the transiency is just tremendous in this period. Buffalo, in, uh, you know, in 1838, one particular day, and I know that it's not, it, it's 
it's on the high end, but it's not unusual. A town of 17, you know, uh, you know, maybe maybe 22,000 at that point. You had 5,000 people getting on steamboats to leave town, and so that's passing through. So the relative rates of transiency are very high uh, for this early period, um, and this is going on around the lakes. This is Chicago. Um, and, uh, who mentioned the emptiness of Lake Michigan when they were up in the, uh, in the big tower. Well, that's what it would have looked like at that time. Now, when we move into the Great Lakes story, this becomes really the realm more of, of the true professional mariner. Ideas and legal structures uh, relating to, to mariners apply directly. And one of the problems in the river cities and in these calls for hospitals that I talk about it's predicated on, on a, a poor understanding of how this is supposed to work. And so the call for the sons of farmers to be covered under this, these worthy people, uh, really ultimately falls on deaf, deaf ears because they fit no definition, no clear definition for a professional mariner. This isn't true on the Great Lakes, uh, and, and it takes off a lot. We don't know a lot about Great Lakes sailors, and that's one of the things that actually interested me to start with, and, I, and I'll get into that in a minute, how I used medicine to get at that issue. Uh, when I talk about the maritime influences, people in some audiences, again, are skeptical about the, white, about the freshwater context of all of this and the relations between the Midwest and the Atlantic, and I can establish it in, the, in a thousand and one ways through technology and culture. If we look at the state flag of Wisconsin, which reflects some imagery adopted in uh, 1848, we see a blue-jacketed mariner here. And this wasn't a random sort of copying out of a book. This, th these were the people that were considered essential to this Midwestern community and identity. Uh, so it really is a transference of maritime culture and practices to this entire region. Uh, so Anglo-American tradition, federal sources, and, of course, sailors are essential to um, defense. I'm going to have to run fast here. Um, in the gulf that's created in, from the 19, 1820s to the 1850s, we have the Catholic Church moving into things. The Daughters of Charity particularly move into the, into the subject, into, the, into it. And they start out in the Baltimore Infirmary, where they, take, where they begin, in a short time, taking over the Marine Department there. Uh, they established, uh, they brought into a hospital in St. Louis where they take over and, and really uh, rationalize the care of mariners there. They take what they learn there, both in terms of the people, but also the economics of it, because there's money attached to it. And that goes into establishing hospitals at Detroit, at Buffalo, and Milwaukee. And so right from the get-go, the success of Catholic churches in the West and how they approach things, this entrepreneurial approach that recent scholars have, have have looked at really have roots in these in these maritime negotiations and working with the um, the federal government. Sisters of Mercy, the same thing. The Daughters of Charity, more important. Um, uh, again, reasons why they're established are in part to directly deal with the problem of nativism. Uh, Bishop Henny, for example, it's a it's a classic smoking gun. We're going to do this among other reasons because this will help create better relations with the Protestant community and how we operate our hospitals uh, is going to be part of that. Key to all of this are the sisters and uh, uh, recent scholarship. Um, vowed women is a, new, uh, a newer uh, sort of understanding of, of, of Catholic and other religious women who get into this nursing and hospital administration for a mix of motivations, spiritual as well. Recent book describes the sisters as unlikely entrepreneurs. That really fits the model of what I've seen. Where they're, where, they're, where they're working the uh, capitalist system in very serious ways and, and show tremendous political skill. You've got a lot of advantages over competing institutions that develop. Uh, poverty, charity, obedience translates into economic and practical advantages and emotional advantages as well in this, in this system, which, which are useful. I'm not going to get into this too much, but they use public health to demonstrate their heroism in a number of ways, or, or at least it's used... It's a very honest approach. Many, many sisters die in that process, but that public heroism translates into goodwill in Protestant communities and others that are uh, poured into more permanent institutions, uh, including the hospitals. I'm going to jump through some of this stuff real quickly because I'm short on time. But I did, um, uh, I looked at many different cities, and one of the things that I was able to do just by the nature of records 
uh, was to reconstruct hospital life in one of the ports, and that's Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And this is a note uh, certifying that uh, a particular mariner has paid his hospital tax and is entitled to the hospital uh, services. And this is the 1870s, again, a very key element. So he would go to the, he would, he would get a, that note from his captain, he would go to the customs house, he'd be uh, uh, entered into the hospital, and we can see from that a little bit just the international aspects of it. Um, one of the things that we see is during this period, who's going into the hospital as mariners in the Great Lakes, uh, about uh, uh, a little over a third are American, 24% are Irish, almost all of them are on steamboats, they're not associated with sailing. Uh, Scandinavians, it's 14%, all of them are on schooners. This is really interesting Atlantic patterns, even when we drill down where in Germany and things these people come from. It really suggests, again, the existence of an Atlantic maritime stream and culture in this, in this region. Um, I, I looked at how the hospital uh, developed in this context, tracking not just, just mariners who had been forgotten from the hospital story, but, but really dissected uh, admissions across different lines. And we can see uh, what one of the things that, that emerges is that mariners, among other things, well, they've got a number of cardinal virtues. Um, one, they are, their, their care is paid for at a time when there's very little money available to go into hospitals and paying patients are very rare. They use the hospital in very different ways. You can't really see what all this uh, leads up to, but we get to categories like injuries, uh, genital urinary problems, uh, you know, mostly uh, but not exclusively social diseases, fevers, which are uh, you, much of it um, lighter, lighter cases of malaria, really illustrates, and I've got the statistics to back this up, that again, mariners are using hospitals in very different ways than other groups. Uh, certainly much more often, but, but, but as part of a strategy. Um, so I unpacked this. What, did, what do these hospitals look like? What does a Catholic hospital look like? Well, there was a small core of residents whose home was the hospital. These, these were uh, the female operated. Um, some of the inmates certainly operated as, uh, as, as quasi-scat staff. The patients are overwhelmingly male. There's seasonal fl fluctuations based on, on shipping seasons. Uh, but, but they operated with multiple outcomes. They were asylums for aged and for infant orphans, for mentally and physically handicapped people who were, who were paying to stay there. They were acute and medium care facilities for charity and paying patients. And they were also these federal marine hospitals that were critical to the whole operation that for a long time constituted 40 to 60 percent uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the hospital population. So it's very important we can take this across, across the region. Uh, the second generation of hospitals that comes in in the Midwest are the Protestant hospitals. And uh, ultimately, they're, they're quite often anti-Catholic. They have higher costs of uh, operation. They are associated with more elite uh, people. And ultimately, they look at patients on questions based on their moral status and their, and their ability to pay. And this leads to some very different elements. And of course, this is, this is how they are seeing the, the, this is how they are seeing the, 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 the sailors. And it's very clear in the treatment. Um, Rowlandson, the sailor's mistake, and it's, you were bred to the sea. Now, I get my bread from the sea, and bad bread it was. And, and this really illustrates these different cultural perceptions of what the sailors represent. Um, look quick uh, clip here on, on differences. Big battles break out of what hospitals are providing the best care, and this is tied to a lot of money. We see it in different places. The most profound is in Buffalo, where the two hospitals battle for about 30 years. And it comes to a head in 1885, and this is the Surgeon General. The reason for assigning the patients to the Sisters Hospital instead of the General Hospital was solely on account of better accommodations. In one case, the sailors have the best accommodations of any in the hospital. In the other case, they have the worst. And we see this again and again. That the nature of care that's provided in these different types of hospitals varies greatly, both in, in moral tone but in, but in outcomes. And I have uh, you know, many, much evidence in the form of letters from sailors, uh, uh, petitions to try to control where they go, and it illustrates this special relationship between, between sailors and, 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 and the sisters, and it, again, it, it runs across the region, and it's outside of it. So, tying it all together a little bit, religion, mariners, Protestant hospitals, basically the line between charity and legal entitlement was unrecognized by the Protestant hospitals who looked at mariners with disdain and who could not profit from their care. The levels of money that were available just wasn't enough to support the, uh, the extra expenses and inefficiencies of Providence hosp pro pro partisan hospitals. These issues and prejudices 
are continued in the historiography today because those are the ideas we see in things like the care of strangers where sailors are, 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 are depicted, if they're depicted at all, as troublesome, they're caring more trouble than they're worth as outsiders. In the Midwestern region, they're foundational, they're central to all of this. In Catholic hospitals, charity was both gift and reward. Mariners represented institutional bounty as a group in need and they were one that provided spiritual and financial recompense. For the sisters, these were people that needed, their, needed what they provided, and, and what they provided allowed them to provide for a greater number of people. And this is clearly articulated in so many, so many decisions that, that happens. In this period, 5 to 10% of all mariners entered hospitals. Um, and the question is why? Well, it's work-related transients, uh, high rates of injury in a dangerous profession, the existence of mandatory health insurance schemes by the 1850s that operated throughout the U.S. And ultimately, this, this program helped mediate the problem of medically indigent mariners. I'll wrap up here real quick. Um, if we look at particular cities where, where, where records are available, Cleveland, Ohio, for example, we can look at, at almshouse records, and I did for those who were available, for on and off for a 20-year period, and out of about 4,000 uh, people that go into that almshouse hospital in Cleveland, there's only about 30 that have a maritime occupation. Um, and there were about four or, th four or 5,000 mariners that went through the Marine Hospital there. And you can, you can very clearly see how, how this altered the ecology of, of welfare in that place and in other places. So it is really important. Last slide, just to get back to um, issues that came up uh, on, on travelers. Sailors still have distinct medical problems as a group. This is an older study from Sweden, and these are the mortality indexes uh, for the Swedes in the post-war period, one of the most modern of merchant marines, 20 times the likelihood of dying by drowning, 6.6 .6 times through other accidents, 4.3 times of the suicide, even digestive disorders. And so transiency, maritime transiency, ret large, ret small, uh, these social groups really represent special problems but the fact that these groups are, clear, when they're clearly articulated, clearly articulated and social policies are, are dictated to addressing the issues, uh, there was great success in, in addressing them. But of course, we get the early 1980s, uh, the Reagan administration, and, uh, and all that is gone. On a global level, the question of mariners is, is still, in, uh, it's actually more of an issue now than it has been probably in 100 years. Thank you.